Hey everyone, Rather Go here. Holy Fury has been an amazing expansion, and I wanted to put out a tutorial on my favorite thing in it so far, which is collecting bloodlines. And I don't mean this, making three bloodlines on the same character is cool. What I mean is this. This is my favorite part of the game. And why do you care about collecting bloodlines? Because you can have a toddler with 54 combat. Your children can arm wrestle bear as unhorsed high lords, what's not to like? This isn't even pushing it particularly far. There are pictures of toddlers with a hundred strength. In a hundred more years, I'll have another five bloodlines on my kids. This is a ridiculous thing in the game, and I really enjoy doing it. And a small disclaimer before we get into it. Things like Blood of a Leader, Soldier Steel Blood, forging any of these bloodlines I have. I'm not going to be showing off how to do that. I'll have a link in the description to the wiki page for it, but I'm not showing you how to make any specific bloodline, but how to steal all of the bloodlines that are already on the map. So, how do you get a bloodline from someone else? Well, obviously you're going to need to marry them into the family, and that's the first hurdle. The second hurdle is bloodline inheritance, and it's actually the one we'll be covering first. You can see that Thordor founded three bloodlines, and all of them are patrilineal inheritance. This is because Thordor is a man, and generally the bloodlines will always pass down, either patrilineal or matrilineally, according to the gender of the founder. A man founded it, they're patrilineal bloodlines. That's how it works. And because of this, since almost all bloodlines in the game are founded by men, almost all bloodlines in the game will have patrilineal inheritance. Now, at first glance, this would actually be a pretty serious roadblock. Because if only the men are passing down their bloodlines, then you can't really merge two sets of bloodlines because the female drops off. However, there's a solution to this. Matrilineal marriages. Every bloodline I have married for in my entire game, even incestuous marriages like this, is a matrilineal marriage. The wiki describes matrilineal marriages as temporarily making all bloodlines have universal inheritance or something along those lines, and that's definitely how it works. In matrilineal marriages, all bloodlines from both parents will pass to the children, regardless of standard inheritance rules, and this is how you're going to go about merging all of your bloodlines into one character. As useful as that is, it's also bad news for some people, because if your faction is incapable of matrilineal marriages, I'm looking at you, Muslims and Merchant Princess, then that's basically the end of any bloodline shenanigans, since matrimarrying is the bread and butter of this particular cheese sandwich. So, on to the marriage game, first you're going to need to find your targets. You do that by opening the ledger in the bottom right, flipping to the last page of the ledger, and this shows you every bloodline in the game. So to find your marriage candidates from this page, you'll need to click on a bloodline, we're going to go with the Merovingians, and this will take you to the founder of that bloodline. If you click on him, it will show you their bloodlines, which is usually just the one they founded. Clicking on the bloodline icon, again, will show you a list of all descendants that are still alive, and you can't filter this list by anything. And if I have one gripe with the bloodline system in this game, it's the massive hassle of getting to this point, because you need to do this for every single bloodline in the game to find out who you can and can't marry for. It's a bit of a hassle. The Merovingians are actually a good example of my second point involving marrying, First, since we have to matrilineally marry, all of these women mean nothing to us, because if we matrilineally marry them, the bloodlines leave our dynasty, it's useless to us. We only care about men, and in smaller dynasties like the Merovingians, that's going to result in us being basically unable to marry at all, because all of the men are very high up in succession. So let's talk about some more difficulties you'll face with this. Let's say I wanted to marry somebody from Abyssinia. Well, I can't, they're too far away, I can't talk to them. That's them done. Let's say that you're a Christian and you want to marry Ragnar Lothbrok. You, you can't. He's a pagan, you're a Christian, it's not going to happen. I think now is a good time to mention the cosmopolitan religious doctrine. Which allows you to marry people from other religions, and when you're reforming your pagan religion, that is really, really useful, because it allows you to get an obscene number of bloodlines much easier than other people might. The Eastern religions are able to do the same thing, however, they're Eastern religions, and thus they're outside of diplomatic range for most bloodlines. And here I'd actually like to demonstrate a thing you can do, this man has the bloodline Parthian blood, which I don't have yet. Let's say I can't marry him and I can't invite him to my court, so that seems like a dead end. There is a way past this. You can send him a gift of money, and you can also send him an artifact. I have tons of them lying around. Let's give him my plus two axe. Now I'll let time tick, and once he gets that... So now that time is ticked, he's gotten the axe, I can buy a favor from him. He's actually willing to agree to it now because he likes me so much. Let time tick again. He was willing to accept my favor, and now I can fight to court, call in the favor, and he's trapped in my court, and since he's in my court, I can force him to marry people. And it's worth remembering, uh, this guy's a good example, I can't invite this guy. He is married. Also, if he's a counselor, I can't invite him for that reason. And if he's close family to his liege, I can't invite him for that reason. So if you're using favors, do remember those three rules. So, alright, you find your target, you get him to agree to matrilineally marry a woman in your dynasty, the question now becomes, who do you want him to marry? 
If you just want one bloodline, that's easy enough. Just marry him to anyone relatively distant to you, and then have that person marry your heir to get it into your dynasty. And do remember on both of these steps to use matrilineal marriage, otherwise you'll mess it all up and you'll start losing bloodlines. But let's say we're more ambitious than that. We don't want one bloodline, we want every bloodline. Because, I mean, let's be real. My youngest daughter, Kraka, has minus seven personal combat. And if we go over to Gare, who I've put all this effort into creating, he's got 54, and Gare is a toddler. So yeah, there's a lot of merit to getting all of the bloodlines, right? There's a lot of bonuses aside from the obvious massive personal combat score. So, how do we get all of the bloodlines as fast as possible? And it isn't... It isn't just by repeating the process for one bloodline over and over again. That would take a minimum of nine generations, and that's very slow. This character has eight bloodlines, and if we were to use the process I laid out for one bloodline eight times in a row, that would take a minimum of nine generations. That's just slow. It's not very quick. So how do you do it faster? Well, doing it faster is going to require a bit of advanced inbreeding. Like all CK tutorials, this whole video is essentially about inheritance and inbreeding, so let's get into it. Which I'm afraid means I have to open my absolutely disgusting family tree. This is a nightmare. Don't do this. Your games get so hard to manage when your family is this big. What we need to do to get all of the bloodlines quickly is to essentially create cadet branches designed to collect bloodlines. In my game, I had four, and I would recommend either having two or four. One is too slow, as we laid out, and having eight is just unreasonably large. In my game, I had one, two, three, four cadet branches collecting bloodlines, and over the course of three generations, I managed to collect eight bloodlines with them. So really, I could have done it with two people over four generations, and it wouldn't have been much slower, but it would have been easier to keep track of. I think two and four are basically the same. Whereas one is unambitious, and eight is frankly unreasonable. And what you do with these people is you marry them for one bloodline each. She married for the blood of Attila. Sigurd the Ruthless married for the Carolingian blood. Alvor married for Ashina blood. And Thordis married for the blood of Caradoc. And what all of these people do after they marry for bloodlines is their children will go on to marry for bloodlines again for a couple of generations. So after a few generations of marrying for bloodlines, you're going to start marrying your cadet branches together. The reason for this is because after a couple of generations, these people are going to be distant kinsmen. It's going to be really hard to get matrilineal marriages for them. So, what you do then is you start marrying your cadet branches to each other in matrilineal marriages. Again, it's always matrilineal marriages if you're merging bloodlines. Otherwise, it won't work. You'll only get the father's bloodline. And in my case, since I had four cadet families, four married down to two, and then two married down to one, and then that one child, in this case, was Gare. Gare's mother had these bloodlines, which is impressive, and Gare's father had these bloodlines creating our super child in gear. So, if you have elective, you can just pick gear as your next heir. That's the problem solved. But if you don't have elective monarchy, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to wait until you get a female child with all of the bloodlines, and then you matrilineally marry that child to your heir, and that will result in them having children of your dynasty in the royal bloodline. And that's it. You've now convinced the world that your leader is descended from basically every important man that ever existed. If you feel like you're good, get out of here, leave. Go convince the world that you're descended from everyone who's ever mattered, but in particular, Genghis, Attila, and Alexander. However, I'm also going to cover a bit of inbreeding because it's sort of relevant to what I've just told you, because the last step was to marry direct family members together. I mean, look at this. Three of my bloodline characters are sisters. Half-sisters, admittedly, because they all came from different mothers, but sisters nonetheless. So let's get some diagrams and wiki pages open. So this is the inbred trait, which we're trying to avoid. Minus 10 Vassal Opinion, minus 30 Attraction, minus 30% Fertility, minus 20 Personal Combat, minus 20 Rationality. I wasn't aware Rationality was exactly a trait, but it's good to know that we don't have it anymore. So how do you avoid getting inbred? Well, it turns out there's a massive chart on this. And the TLDR of this chart is that it checks your past five generations for number of unique ancestors. And the really important number here is 23. Once you drop from 23 to 22, your chance jumps from 39% to 80%, more than doubles. So going under 23 is catastrophic, but staying above 32 is completely safe. What does this actually mean? How many unique ancestors do you even have? This feels very abstract, and I've made a chart for this. This is an example chart I've made of your past five generations. You actually have up to 62 unique ancestors. And now that you've seen this, I'm going to show you an example of this that I used. In my case, this is what my diagram looks like. Let's go over the key before I get into it. Purple is a dynastic family member. Bright green is a bloodline that I married for, and dull green is their assumed-to-be-unique ancestors. So, in this example, 
when we get back to our first generation, they come from the same mother and father on both sides, who have obviously the same parents again on both sides. But this is only six people. That's still 56 people who are unique in this family tree. You're comically high above 32. So the point of all this is really to say that even though what we're doing is clearly inbreeding, it's enough to sketch you out about it, you're nowhere near the inbred trait. Here's another example where it's not even particularly effective. This is to get two bloodlines in three generations, which is only as good as marrying them directly yourself. And in this situation, even though there's a lot more black where you have redundant family members, it's still only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 people who aren't unique. And at this point, it occurs to me I'm not 100% clear whether or not it counts them once or zero times if they fail to be unique. So it's either 62 minus 14, which is 48, or it's 62 minus 28. But even 62 minus 28 is still 34, which beats the threshold for inbred. So realistically, there's no real risk of getting the inbred trait if you're remotely rational about what you're doing when you're collecting bloodlines. To my knowledge, that's pretty much everything you need to know to go collect bloodlines. Eventually, like six generations down the line, you end up with totters that have 54 personal combat that are descended from everyone who's ever mattered in the entire world. To quickly recap, you use the ledger to find your targets, and then you matrilineally marry them into your family. You repeatedly do that until you have bloodline characters with like six bloodlines in them, and then you go through whatever hoops you need to to get that person on your throne. It's a little bit more complicated than that makes it sound, but it's more obtuse than it is difficult. Anyway, I'd rather not ramble forever. This has been Rather Incoherent, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that other shilly channel growth nonsense. I'll see you around.